This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. At least eight killed in the biggest protests across Sudan. Tensions escalate between Libya's militia and Turkey as Haftar's army detains six Turkish nationals. And Hong Kong celebrates 22nd anniversary of handover from Britain to China. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Searle and Zah, live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. Let's take a look at other stories making headlines this hour. Kenya Safaricom shares fall following the death of the tele Teleco CEO, Bob Collymore. And in sports, Mohamed Salah inspires Egypt into the round of 16 as Madagascar stuns Nigeria to qualify for the knockouts as Group B's top team. We start in Afghanistan where the Taliban has claimed responsibility for a massive explosion which killed at least 34 people in the capital, Kabul. The attack took place near the Ministry of Defense at rush hour on Monday morning when streets were full of people going to work and school. A truck loaded with explosives were, was detonated near the ministry's engineering department. The area was quickly blocked off by security forces and ambulances. Let's go to Sudan, where at least eight people have been reportedly killed following the biggest mass demonstrations against the military rulers at the weekend. Tens of thousands of protesters rallied across Sudan on Sunday to push the Transitional Military Council to hand over power to civilian rule. The demonstrations were the first since a military crackdown on the 3rd of June. Protesters flooded streets in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, and other cities, flashing victory signs and carrying Sudanese flags. They were responding to calls made by protest leaders to pressure military council to hand over power to civilians. Sunday's demonstration had been seen as a test for protest organizers after deadly crackdown on the 3rd of June where around 130 people were killed. The marchers also passed by the homes of those killed during demonstrations. Even though there's no internet, there was a million man march, and this is only in Khartoum. Just look behind you, you will never say they cut off the internet. I had to come out tonight. I had to march. I had to march for everyone killed. I had to march for the martyrs that died, the girls that were raped. I had to march to achieve something. I want to give a message to the Transitional Military Council. We won't leave you and we will take our rights back. The military council had warned it will hold the alliance entirely responsible if any soul is lost in Sunday's protests. There are those who take advantage of differences and abuse them, bringing us trouble. We have continuously warned that the duty of security forces is the protection of the millions march. But we cannot know when there will be infiltrators. As it is, unknown snipers have shot three members of the RSF and maybe five or six civilians. That is why we're upset and trying to get things under control. But God willing, people will understand that the snipers have been shooting at people from the beginning of the change until now. We will punish them and bring them to justice. But international partners have warned against any violence. The opposition insists it will continue to press the military until it hands over power to civilians. Peace talks between the military council and opposition broke down after the raid on protesters on the 3rd of June. Ethiopia and the AU have proposed a blueprint for a civilian majority body, which the generals say could be a basis for resuming talks. Chom Hono, CGTN. Tensions are on the rise between Libya's militias and Turkey. Six Turkish citizens have been reportedly detained by the Libyan National Army under the command of Khalifa Haftar. Haftar has ordered his forces to attack Turkish targets in Libya and has also banned commercial flights from Libya to Turkey. Let's turn to our correspondent, Michael Barr-David, for more. 
Turkey is taking the escalation in Libya very seriously. There were several statements made by different bodies of the Turkish government. The first statement was made by Turkey's defense minister Hulusi Akar. He stated, and I quote, any aggression or hostile movements towards us while we are trying to contribute to regional peace and stability will pay a very high price and face the most effective and strong retaliation. We are prepared against any hostilities towards us. This was by the defense minister. Another statement was made by Turkey's presidential spokesman Ibrahim Kalin on Twitter. He stated, and I quote, Detention of six Turkish citizens by Haftar's illegal militia in Libya is an act of banditry and piracy. We expect our citizens to be released immediately. Otherwise, Haftar elements will become legitimate targets. So basically, the emphasis here is on legitimate targets. Uh, Turkey is emphasizing that they would not hesitate to take military action to retaliate against any movements against Turkish uh, forces. So this is a major threat from Turkey in response as well. Haftar's forces had also claimed that they shot down a Turkish drone in Tripoli. Now, Turkey is known to uh, support the UN-backed Libyan government. They provide them with weapons and drones as well. So the threats in the region really could lead to an escalation in Libya. I'm Mikhail Bardavid for CGTN in Antalya. Still in Libya, where on Sunday the Eastern Commander Khalifa Haftar claimed that his LNA forces shot down a Turkish drone. According to Haftar's militia, the drone was shot down near the country's only functioning civilian airport near Tripoli. The LNA airstrike prompted a brief closure of the Matiga airport. But authorities say that flights have now resumed. Let's get more from CGTN's Adel El Marui in Cairo. Adel, thank you for joining us here on Africa Live. Let's dig straight into it. What more can you tell us about these claims by the LNA on the destruction of a Turkish drone? Adel. It's not the first um, announcement from the LNA about targeting any Turkish aircrafts. Uh, about um, three days ago, the LNA spokesman Ahmed El Mismeri has also said that they have shot at a Turkish drone, but he did not mention if it has been destroyed or uh, it was hit precisely. Um, the recent um, uh, information about the latest attack that you've just mentioned, it was at Tripoli Airport. and. It seems from um, the military sources, the LNA sources um, from the eastern side um, that belong to Khalifa Haftar, that the Turkish drone um, was um, stationed or at least in a landing position inside Tripoli um, airport. It is part of an escalation where the LNA forces say that they will consider any Turkish properties, vessels, ships, um, aircrafts or even in uh, uh, business facilities inside Libya, anything is, uh, that is of Turkish interest will be considered by the LNA as a hostile target and will be dealt with immediately. Well, thanks for sharing. The, uh, Adel, the LNA has also threatened to target more Turkish interest in Libya. How significant are Turkish investments and, of course, their presence there? Well, it is quite big. There are billions of dollars invested by Turkish businesses in Libya. Uh, if we talk about the trade volume, um, there is in 2018, the tra trade volume went down actually to reach 1.8 billion US dollars. Um, it was previously um, more than 2 billion. And um, there are investments from um, Turkish companies into the electricity sector alone, estimated at 2.25 billion um, US dollars. That's beside the rest of the uh, industries and sectors. Turkey has been looking into investing into farming and cultivating land inside Libya. So there are huge interest from Libya to um, deal with Libya with Libya from Turkey to deal with Libya in terms of businesses and expand its investments in Libya despite the ongoing war. Well Adel there is now talk that the Libyan National Army is keen to provoke Turkey into getting involved in the military conflict in Libya to divert attention over violations of an arms embargo. What are regional authorities saying about this Adel? Well, for, for, for several years, the LNA forces have been putting the spotlight on Turkish support to uh, the government of National Akkad uh, and how it has been giving it um, some cover. Um, it, 
the, the, the main reason behind the provocation of um, the LNA forces is the recent uh, loss of ground in Ghirian city, which was uh, a prime location for um, the LNA forces. And according to the spokesman Ahmed al Mismeri, Turkish forces helped the allies and the uh, militias that supports the government of National Accord, recognized by the EU, and to gain control over Ghirian. Um, there have been, uh, from the Turkish side, announcement that what Turkey is doing in Libya is trying to maintain balance uh, in the conflict domestically. There is an arms embargo, however, there has been huge military support coming in um, to Khalifa Haftar's forces, the Libyan National Army, from regional allies. And that has, in recent months, made Haftar advance significantly on the ground, disregarding the arms embargo. So Turkey believes it is restoring the balance in the conflict instead of letting one side being supported by regional powers to take over the entire country and jeopardize any political solution. Um, and therefore, that is the main reason that the LNA forces are quite irritated. They want to point fingers that the arms embargo are also being violated from Faisal Sarraj's side as well. And Adele, my final question before I let you go. There has been escalation and a lot of fighting over the town of Garyan, which is now in, the, in control of the UN-backed government of Libya. How important is this town for both sides of the conflict? It is of great significance. Uh, for Khalifa Haftar forces, this was the city from which they have announced their military offensive against Tripoli. Um, and, and since April 4th, that where um, the main supply of arms have been going and the main storage of weapons have been stationed inside that city to supply um, the military forces that support Khalifa Haftar in their attempt to take over Tripoli. Um, so getting back or pushing away Haftar uh, from Ghirian and the GNA forces, um, the Western Tripoli government gaining control once again of Ghirian is a significant strategic um, advantage. And it means that they have pushed further their defense line from just a few kilometers at certain parts in Tripoli to 500 miles away uh, from um, Tripoli. That's doesn't mean that there isn't fight going on on a closer range. There is still uh, a lot of clashes going on, but stationing in Ghirian, it means that the main supply line of weapons, arms, and personnel for Khalifa Haftar forces have been cut. There is another um, station for Haftar near Tripoli. However, it is not as big or significant by any mean as Ghirian was. All right, Adel El Maruki talking to us from Cairo. Thank you for breaking it down for us. Moving on. Meanwhile, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, one protester has been shot dead in the eastern city of Goma on Sunday. The police have been breaking up banned marches in various cities in the DRC, including the capital, Kinshasa. The demonstrations were organized by former presidential candidate Martin Fayulu and opposition leader Jean-Pierre Bemba. They are disputing the outcome of last year's presidential election. Because they were hostile, we tried to talk to them. They started to throw projectiles. You have the images. We use two or three tear gas. It is perfectly legal and there is no problem. There are no wounded people and there is no arrest so far. Today, we are the object of an aggression organized by the police sent by Kabila and Sishikedi. What can you understand about what is happening here? Holes have been punched in car tires. The police confiscated money and cell phones from peaceful citizens. Journalists were attacked. Their cameras are being taken and all that. Where are we? Hong Kong has been celebrating its 22nd anniversary of its handover from Britain to China. Beyond the celebration, how has Hong Kong's economy performed over the past 22 years? And what hopes do the locals hold for their future? CGTN's Yu Yang has this story. The Chinese national flag and the regional flag of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region are raising at the Golden Bohemia Square. The sculpture Forever Blooming Bohemia has witnessed the tremendous changes in Hong Kong since its return to China 20 years ago. Uh, 
，我觉得我对呃香港的希望啊，未来都是很有充满信心的。Since its handover to China, Hong Kong has seen a stable economic growth. Last year, the regional GDP hit over 2.6 trillion Hong Kong dollars, more than double that of 1996 in nominal value. Hong Kong is also seen as one of the most economically competitive regions in the world. The region has been ranked as the freest economy in the world for 25 consecutive years by the Index of Economic Freedom of the Heritage Foundation. A United Nations report says Hong Kong absorbed over 100 billion U.S. dollars in direct foreign investment in 2017, ranking third in the world. In terms of investment stock, Hong Kong ranked second in the world as the source and recipient of investment, only after the United States. In fact, by promoting the coordinated development of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. We can further enhance Hong Kong's position as an international financial shipping trade center and international aviation hub. In 2017, China's ambitious plan of building the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau Greater Bay Area officially kicked off. Consisting of cities and regions along the Pearl River Delta and covering over 56,000 square kilometers, the area is set to enhance its status as one of China's most open and economically vigorous regions. And many, of course, see it as a great opportunity for Hong Kong. We have returned. We have got strong support for our own country. And we have seen President Xi Jinping is designing and promoting the establishment of the Greater Bay Area. This could be a good opportunity for Hong Kong's own development. We hope that Hong Kong people can take advantage of the opportunities of building the Greater Bay Area and integrate into the area. The move could improve Hong Kong's economy and people's livelihood. Hong Kong's future will be better. By the end of this year, the total population in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area is respected to reach over 70 million, and many people in Hong Kong say they will never stop working towards a better future. Yu Yang, CGTN. And the news continues on Africa Live. Here's a look at what's ahead. We'll tell you why African countries are widening the ban on single-use plastics. And does it honor women or objectify them? The raging debate about dowry in Africa. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen? For yourself, if it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live, find your voice. Africa Live, find your voice. Welcome back. Across the African continent, more countries are clamping down on single-use plastics. Kenya is now extending the orders to ban their use in beaches, national parks, forests, and conservation areas, effective June the 5th, 2020. CGTN's Daniel Arab Moy takes a look at the growing list of countries taking on the environmental issue. Africa is taking the plastic problem very seriously. More than 15 countries on the continent have either banned them completely or charged a tax on them. Some of the countries in Africa that have bans or taxes in place include the following. Tanzania officially announced a ban on the entry of all plastic carrier bags into its territory, effective 1st June 2019. All plastic carrier bags, regardless of their thickness, is prohibited from being imported, exported, manufactured, sold, stored, supplied and used in mainland Tanzania. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta announced a ban on single-use plastics in beaches, national parks, forests and conservation areas. 
The ban will take effect on June 5th, 2020. The production and use of plastic bags became a criminal offense in Mali on December 31st, 2013, making Africa the leading continent in the global crackdown on plastic bags. In 2012, Cameroon formally banned the use of non-biodegradable plastics in the country. The ban made the importing, trading, and commercial use of plastic bags a criminal offense. Exceptions were made for plastics that are essential for health and hygiene. In 2008, the small East African nation of 12 million people instituted a national ban on non-biodegradable plastic bags. The government introduced amendments to the law banning plastic bags. The ban on use of plastics or single-use plastics in Africa is now minimizing the creation of waste, much of which drifts and ends up in the world's oceans. In places without any such prohibitions, waste continues to be a major problem. Now, despite efforts to minimize and ban single-use plastics, solutions are often met with resistance from business, government or civil society due to the intended and unintended consequences leaving many questioning the most appropriate solution to reducing the leakage. Back to you. Plastic pollution is threatening South Africa's biodiversity along the country's coastline. The new environmental ministerial team is now looking at all kinds of new measures to curb the problem, including casting a much wider ban of plastics in public spaces. CGTN's Travers Andrews has this report. It's no secret that Cape Town has developed a plastic pollution problem, which has been made worse by the thousands of tons of water bottles left over from the drought. It's presented a very unique problem. On the one hand, it threatens the environment and biodiversity, and on the other, it's creating new opportunities, which could potentially put food on the table for some. The recycling industry has enormous potential to create jobs. It's very underdeveloped. We, we tend to think about it as just being people who, you know, rubbish pickers. Whereas I think that there's, an, there's, a, there's enormous potential there in terms of uh, waste recycling. The government, though, has tried to curb single-use plastic pollution for many years now, including charging a levy for every carry bag that is bought from a store. Beverage and bottling companies have also set up their own industry body called Petco, which connects recyclers to collectors. And that initiative has shown to be a great success in reducing the amount of bottles being dumped. We are already recycling uh, roughly two-thirds of the plastic of the PET that is put uh, into the marketplace. Now this model that has been uh, very successful in South Africa is now being replicated to Kenya and other uh, countries in the continent. One of the single largest plastic pollution concerns, though, is the threat it poses to marine biodiversity, including animals such as fish and seabirds. Even though South Africans are estimated to use around 30 to 40 kilograms of plastics a year, which is roughly one third of what is used in the U.S., a lot of that still ends up here in the canal system and eventually into the ocean. Which is why the government is stepping in with its own plan to prevent the ocean from continuing to look like this. We have a program we call Source to Sea, which is a whole program that, in, that involves working on riverbeds and waterways so that you prevent the plastic from getting to the sea in the first place. Um, and that's obviously a, a very important activity. Once Parliament reconvenes, the Environmental Department is also expected to host strategic meetings on new measures needed to fight plastic pollution. But whether that will lead to a ban on single plastic use remains to be seen. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. Dowry has been a subject of intense debate across Africa. There are those who can afford it and others cannot. Then there are those who feel that it objectifies women. Now the debate has extended to whether love has been sacrificed at the altar of material gain. So should we pay dowry or not? CGTN's Yolisa and Jamela has more from South Africa. Dowry or lobola, as it is known here in South Africa, is an age-old custom that involves the transfer of cattle from the prospective husband to the family of his prospective bride. 
The main function of this custom is to offer a token of appreciation to the parents of the bride-to-be for raising her. Paying lobola dowry or bride price is a custom in many parts of the continent and calculating it is steeped in tradition. Over the years, this tradition of paying lobola has moved into the 21st century. Instead of transfer of cattle, the transaction is now cash-based. Critics say it commoditizes women, thus disempowering them. It's not that. It's, it, it, it's a cultural symbolism that sort of puts two families together, a coming together of two families. That, that acknowledges that this is who we are now, are creating a new family. But many maintain that the custom has the power to forge bonds. So when a person A meets person B, African culture acknowledges that person A and person B each are part of a system. And in fact, the, the rituals that uh, are involved in Lobola negotiations are bringing those two systems together, acknowledging that we are stronger uh, working together than when we work as individuals. And I think that is the beauty of the, of the, of the, of the practice. Ramufuku asserts, though, that this custom can still be practiced without the exchange of money. Families can come uh, 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 together without the man or the woman paying money. In fact, you can zero rate that. You can still have all the rituals of exchanging gifts, of families coming together, blessing you know, the people who want to get married, and decide that, in fact, it is going to be, from a, a, a commercial point of view, a zero game. In fact, both parents can decide to exchange gifts or gift the, the, the two newlyweds. This custom has, however, often had unfavorable results. Some demands for dowry have seen weddings called off. Some demands for dowry have proven to be a recipe for turmoil in many marriages as the couples grapple with the debt that they accrued while seeking funds for the dowry. So that can, that can and does create turmoil because then how do they get married? For because more often than not, the lobola comes in before the marriage ceremony happens. Because the families tend to insist that they should be lobola first before the marriage ceremony. They are already starting on the back foot because either they've had to borrow, the husband is had to borrow, or they've had to borrow from somewhere. The practice remains an intrinsic part of getting married for many South Africans. Yuri Sanjamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Chirping of birds, sounds of whispering trees, burbling of streams. When sunlight sets the forest's leaves aglow and waterfall surges down from the mountain, we see and hear the Earth's wondrous beauty. The Earth is meant to be appreciated and the life of its inhabitants deserves our endless exploration. Come with CGTN to listen and see in Chorus of Life, to marvel at nature and life.
And we have your business news coming up next. Here's a look at what's ahead. Kenya Safaricom shares fall following the death of the Teleco CEO, Bob Collymore. And ECOWAS state adopt a flexible Forex regime to foster trade. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live, find your voice. Welcome back. Safaricom's chief executive officer, Bob Collymore, is dead. He succumbed after nearly a year-long battle with cancer. Shares of East Africa's most profitable company fell at the Nairobi Stock Exchange following the announcement of his, of his death this morning. Panina Karibe has the story. Safaricom chief executive officer, Bob Collymore, died at his home after battling with acute myeloid leukemia. As CEO of Safaricom, the telco has posted record profits. It recently declared a record 19.9% increase in net income and a $619 million profit. In 2017, East Africa's most profitable firm was thrown into confusion after he took sudden leave after falling ill. After undergoing treatment, he announced his return in May 2019. Following news of his death, Twitter was flooded with condolence messages from well-wishers, including the Kenyan president Uhuru Kenyatta and peers in the industry. Until his demise, he was the longest-serving CEO of the telecom firm, having taken over from his predecessor, Michael Joseph, in 2010. Safaricom shares fell by 2.7% when markets opened on Monday following his death. Colin Moore, who was 61 years old, was due to step down in August after nine years at the helm, during which time Safaricom's shares price rose by more than 400%. ECOWAS member states have adopted a flexible currency regime in efforts to boost regional integration and trade. However, the bloc is required to set up a monetary union that would initiate plans for the single currency dubbed ECHO. The currency will be launched in 2020. Currency trading in the region has proved challenging as most commodity prices are regulated on international markets. To achieve regional integration, member states are required to boost the identification of people to facilitate free movement and removal of trade barriers. ECOWAS declined to join the African Continental Free Trade Agreement trade deal, which came into force last month. It is meant to eliminate most tariffs to create a single market with the free movement of goods and services. And the three-day 2019 summer Davos has opened in the northeast China's coast city of Dalian. The gathering, also known as the 13th annual meeting of the new champions, featured a theme of leadership 4.0, succeeding in a new era of globalization. The forum, the forum includes meetings on global cybersecurity, China's economic outlook, and self-driving cars. More than 1,900 participants from over 100 countries and regions are on hand for the sessions. 
All right, I'm now joined by Hugh Xiao in Dalian for the latest on Summer Davos. Thank you for joining us. Now, what are some of the themes related to Africa in the three-day Davos Forum? Sure, I don't know if you can see the picture behind me. Guests are slowly coming down after a long day of session on globalization and technology. Both are unstoppable, but the key question is how to include more people in the process and not make them feel left behind. And I, earlier I was talking to the chief technology officer of the World Economic Forum, and he mentioned access being one of the key issues here, how to increase internet access on the African continent, for example. And there are different approaches to that, uh, either to allow for individual access or uh, village level access so that people can tap into this information and knowledge economy and get benefit from it. And also on the third day of the forum, there will be a session on the future of the Belt and Road Initiative, a massive uh, infrastructure and trade network that is familiar to the African continent. As we know, China has signed more than 120 cooperation agreements with many countries in the world, including African nations. And the initiative is helping countries like Kenya uh, to industrialize and more importantly, to make the people People there are uh, better off. So it is an example of more well-off nations helping other countries to find a path to common prosperity. Also, there's this talk on data here, uh, helping African countries to build in the data ecosystem so that lives can be improved and efficiencies of those tech companies can be boosted. So as you can see, the main message at this year's forum is no matter how fast technologies are developing, they should always include as many people and countries as possible. Back to you. All right, thank you, Qiu Xiao, for your insights. Moving on, the summer Davos in China's northeastern city of Dalian is not only about discussion sessions, but also a platform for high-tech display. Early on, Qiu Xiao talked out, checked out rather, some of the coolest displays at the venue. Let's take a look. Standing in front of the camera to get my face scanned for a few seconds. Here it comes, all the data about me gender, age, race, and even mood. The, the system scans your face and compares your face to a large database of other faces that have been uh, tagged according to a set of personality attributes and makes a correlation to see how much your face looks like all the other faces. Well, the computation results of the biometric mirror are quite disappointing. For instance, it says I have low kindness and high aggressiveness. Well, definitely not the way I think of myself. Professor Vetter says these run outcomes are a cautionary tale that technologies like AI and machine learning are far from being perfect. And round data can be abused for bad purposes. So if you're matched to a terrorist face, then you are ascribed attributes of being like a terrorist. That has major consequences to how then others judge you. And this is what the future hospital looks like. Surgeries being performed by doctors and robots. The four robotic arms are executing orders from the surgeon. This surgical robot is now applied to extracting tumors and killing cancer cells. The biggest advantage of the system is that it assists surgeons to perform minimally invasive surgery. That means patients can only have four small holes on their bodies and thus they can have less blood loss and less chances of infections and com complications. Finally, this booth called Digital Mimic gives those who aspire to be celebrities a chance. Your face can be changed to Bruce Lee, Neil Armstrong, Audrey Hepburn, you name it. Basically, we take one single input image and create different expressions from that image. So we can basically put someone else's face onto someone else. Why is it dangerous? Because with this technology, you can create fake news, fake videos that look realistic. These tech displays are not just stunts of the show. They are trying to encourage participants to think deeper about technology, how it is shaping our lives, and what ramifications it may have for our future. So well, CGTN, Dalian, Downing Province. And we are not done just yet. We have a lot more wonderful, amazing, and inspiring stories coming your way. Here's a look at what's ahead. Nigeria's Tini Ola Apata shakes up the music scene with her unique videos and swag. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. 
the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Meanwhile in Nigeria, Tenny Ola Apata, properly known as Tenny, is taking the country's music scene by storm. From her style to her tongue-in-cheek videos, Tenny is finding success on her own terms. CGTN's Asta Tal has Tenny's story. Let's take a look. Music is no stranger to Nigeria, and neither are superstars. But for Tenny, it's not just her singing that's shaking up the country's music scene. It's everything, from her unmistakable tomboy swag to her humorous and envelope-pushing music. I used to always get in trouble because I, I just don't know how to follow rules. Like, if you tell me don't go there, I want to know why I shouldn't go there. So I want to go and see for myself what is there that you say I should not go and see there. Her daredevil attitude combined with her approachableness have made Tenny a rising star. She boasts more than 1.5 million followers on Instagram, and in real life, the crowds go wild for Tenny. She came out on stage, right? And that excitement of like the music they hear on, on, you know, on the radio, and it's just as good, if not better, live. Coming from a family of musicians, Teddy has always had a love for music. While she always knew it would be her future, she wanted to do it her way. If you don't have the mentality of success, it's, they will cage you and tell you, you know, this is how you should be. But I don't want to be like that. I want to be me. As her star continues to rise, there is indeed no reason for Teddy to be anything other than herself. Astatal, CGTN. The work of two of South Africa's most renowned photographers is on display at the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. On Common Ground showcases the compelling work of Peter Magubani and the late David Goldblatt during South Africa's dark and oppressive past. This comes as South Africa marks the 25th year of its democracy. CGTN's Julie Shire visited the exhibition. Through the camera lenses of two of South Africa's internationally acclaimed photographers, On Common Ground is an exhibit of the work of Peter Magubani and the late David Goldblatt, each telling different stories of apartheid's turbulent times. While Peter was very much a hard newsman and a photojournalist, and David con concentrated most of his life on softer moments, on softer documentary, if you like, uh, whereas Peter was right there in the news on the front line. What I wanted is to show the, the country, the other people, the other side of the country, what is going on in the country. We've got to put our hands together, fight the system, so that we get, we get our freedom. For six decades, these two photographers captured iconic images of day-to-day -day life in South Africa. Magobani more notably documented pivotal moments in the height of the struggle against apartheid. Uh, he was there um, when, when the members of the ANC signed the Freedom Charter in Clipsbread. He was there at the Sharpeville Massacre. He was there during the June 16th Soweto uprising. He was also there documenting the Boy Badung massacre. Magubani, a victim himself of South Africa's segregation laws, spent nearly 500 days in solitary confinement, but he was determined not to be silenced. His documenting of the 1976 Soweto student uprisings and other pivotal moments in South Africa's struggle won him international acclaim. I made sure that uh, nobody tells me what to do with my camera. I made use of my camera. 
I told myself that um, police or no police, I'm not killing anyone. I will go in and take my pictures under all circumstances. David was very prepared for this exhibition with Peter at the instigation of the Goodman Gallery. He admired enormously Peter's commitment and his body of work, and also his bravery and personal courage in the sad, bad times of this country before 1994. Makobani became Nelson Mandela's official photographer upon the statesman release in 1990, but his photographic genius, which brought to life the struggle fought and won by millions, will be most valued in South Africa's historical archive as the country celebrates 25 years of freedom. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. And in Egypt, where a Chinese film festival held in Cairo is celebrating the 70th anniversary of the PRC. At the opening ceremony, guests enjoyed a screening of the new Chinese science fiction blockbuster, The Wandering Earth. The Chinese ambassador to Egypt, Liao Liqiang, also gave an opening speech. He said that China and Egypt have become closer since the establishment of a comprehensive strategic partnership in 2014. The China Film Festival will further cultural exchange and deepen mutual understanding. Ambassador Liao also mentioned that China has an annual production of more than 900 feature films and creates nearly $9 billion annually at the box office. The film festival will last until July the 18th and many Chinese classics will be shown in both Cairo and Alexandria. And if you want to catch a bus in Senegal, you might want to hop on a Karapide, a colorful minibus unique to the country. Terry Wangari explores the iconic mode of transportation. If you're on the streets of Dakar, you'll be sure to see a car rapid. The name means fast car in English. While these colorful minibuses are far from speedy, from the 1970s they have stood as an unofficial symbol of the coastal city. All my life I have lived in Dakar. When I left school at the age of 15, I quickly became interested in crafts. Car rapids have always inspired me. It's like the symbol of Dakar. But the common mode of transportation is full of safety concerns due to poor maintenance. The government is considering whether to ban the colorful minibuses, a decision that could affect a whole industry and its players, such as Musa, who takes pride in the attention he pays to each car rapide he paints. It took me several years of learning to paint like this. It's not easy at all. After the painting, I let the cars dry in the open air. If there is enough sun, I can do four to five cars rapides a day. A common mode of transportation, a rolling piece of art. Either way, Dakar's car rapide stand as moving symbols of Dakar. Terry Wangari, CGTN. And we've got your sports news coming up after the break. Don't touch that dial. Don't go away. Here's a sneak peek at the headline.